Hey, this is Bob Forrest, and you're listening to Sober Guy Radio. That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. Thanks for tuning in today. Thanks to humans for bringing us in. Thanks to you for supporting the show. We have a great episode for you today. We have Bob, Rehab Bob Forrest joining the show. And we're going to get to him in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you about something that I'm super pumped about. The I Am Sober app is back and it's free. Let me ask you, have you checked out the I Am Sober app? If not, you need to do so right now. You can get an overview of your sobriety milestones and all the money you saved. I'm looking at my app right now. Uh, So far I've saved $15,260 in four years, two months, and four days without alcohol. I have 300 days until my next yearly milestone. Really, really cool. And even better, Nick and the guys over uh, on the I Am Sober app team, uh, they made it free. So you can go to the Apple uh, store uh, you can go to the Google Play Store. You can go to the website. That's imsoberapp.com. And so be sure to check it out. We're super pumped here at Sober Guy to have the guys back um, and uh, and working together with them to help support this uh, this really cool app. So go to imsoberapp.com to check it out there. Now, let's get to our guest today. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. I, I got to have a really great conversation with Bob Forrest. And uh, Bob is hilarious and he's very passionate and he's fucking real, like straight up. And that's what I really dug about this. Um, you know, he tells it like it is, and, and that's the way it is. And we had some comedy in there. We had a good time. So it was really cool to chat with him. Uh, let's get to it. Here's Bob Forrest. Today's guest is Bob Forrest. Uh, some of you may know him as Rehab Bob. Uh, he's an addiction counselor, program founder at Allo House Recovery Centers uh, down in Southern California. Um, Now, Bob's an addiction expert expert and uh, perhaps best known as the straight talking, straight shooting counselor on VH1's Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew. Um, He's had a long, long journey, a long struggle with addiction, Um, visited rehabs uh, 24 times at least before finding sobriety in 1996. And I spent the last 17 years being of service and uh, becoming one of the foremost chemical dependency counselors working in the Southern California region. Uh, Bob, man, it's great to have you on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love talking about this stuff. It's weird in the intro when you're saying, you know, I'm an a addiction expert or something. I, <laughs> all I know is I was an expert addict, and now I just try to try to help wherever I can. I don't know that I'm an expert at it, but I was I was a champion drug addict. I can tell you that. Well, shit. Since you started it off, let's just jump in right there. Then we'll start with that. I I was just telling you before we hit record. I was checking out some YouTube videos of the Pink Pop Festival, May 31st, 1993. Man, it was, it is absolutely amazing uh, to see, you know, the work you're doing today, how you've been able to change your life and then go on to help other people coming from a, a place of the, uh, the depths of addiction where you're at. So maybe we can start there and um, have you talk a little bit about your, your past experience uh, um, when you were really, uh, really in a bad, a bad spot. Yeah, no, I was, you know, I wanted, unlike the kids these days, I wanted to be a drug addict from the time I was like 13. Wow. You know, there was, and and Anthony Kiedis and me and Flea and all of us growing up as late baby boomers, you know, we became obsessed with Jaco Pistorius and Billie Holiday and Charlie Parker and, and you name it, Jimmy Page, Keith Richards. I mean, everybody who was an artist was a flawed human being and a, had a troubled heart and and I was just obsessed with it and and part of that at 13 14 sitting in my room listening to Ziggy Stardust was I need to do drugs <laughs> to, to know what these people are talking about hmm. I mean that that world doesn't exist anymore you know yeah. what I mean yeah so yeah. I always feel like I'm a little bit of a dinosaur drug addict but it never it never was a negative to be a drug addict to me. It was cool. 
Yeah. Jimmy Page was a drug addict. Are you kidding me? He's the coolest human being on the face of the earth. So, so, so uh, that changed, that change over the last 40 years. Now it's yeah. pathetic. And everybody's a drug addict. Your grandma's a drug addict. Your mom's <laughs> a drug addict. Everybody's lined up at Walmart to get their fucking opiates. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's so mainstream. It makes McDonald's look <laughs> edgy. <laughs> yeah, but I, no, but and I see what you're saying though, because at that time, back in the day, there was an art, there was there was an art to it. So you feel there's this there's this big, um, if you were there's into music, if you were into that, art, what it was like is the the cool people, Lenny Bruce and Jimi Hendrix and all these people, they've they've opened Pandora's box and inside there is magical stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and instead of a doctor telling you you got back pain and all the nonsense that goes on now, so all the the romanticism and all the the kind of things that I grew up with wanting to experience, like I always say, when we were kids, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, we'd load up speed balls and ride our bikes up to Hollywood Lake and shoot speed balls overlooking Hollywood, going, one day we're gonna rule this town. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what kids are doing yeah. the last 20 years. Yeah. And and in fact we did end up ruling, ruling that town. Well yeah. <laughs> and so and so so talk and a little so bit I about that. Inspire, I want to inspire young people to get back in the mentality of like you've got to just anything is possible. Yeah. Stop thinking that everything is shit. Hmm. You know, and the, and so why drugs are so popular now is everybody thinks everything is shit, so they might as well just get wasted and and be unconscious. And and we've got to fight this. All of us sober people need to help young people understand it's a lot, life is badass. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's a good point that you bring up is that you're you're kind of helping um, to, to shape that and start speaking out about it. Whereas maybe in your day, you didn't have, um, the guys you were looking up to because obviously it was, it was just different than, um, now do you feel like there's a big shift in that where, where, where guys like yourself, um, other people who have, have heavy influence, whether it's through music or media, or, or maybe it's just a, a, a guy in your local community that you really look up to. You have these men and women out there who are actually, um, <laughs> talking about it and saying, just like you said, Hey, there is a good life out there. You don't have to be a dope fiend, uh, to have fun. Like you can have yeah, a damn that's good exactly. time sober. Hey, listen, it goes, it spreads across. I'm in Southern California. I go to meetings all over in Yucca Valley and 29 Palms and the upper desert and in Hollywood. There's inspiring people that are sober in the 12 step world everywhere. There's mm -hmm. bikers, there's sober biker groups and they are, they are real bikers. They're not just wearing leathers on the weekend. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? There's sober communities everywhere of inspiring people. And so what has to happen is you got to get through that ugly rigmarole of the rehab world, which is yeah. just a cesspool, yeah. and get out there into the sober world and get around people that inspire you and get around people that encourage you. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's what was available to me. It was weird. When I got sober, I got so I started trying to get sober in '88, and then in '96 I got sober. And through that nine years of going in and out and going to rehabs and going all around, I met all these amazing, fascinating people—people people that had played music with Charlie Parker and Billie Holiday, this guy Buddy Arnold, um, this woman that was friends with Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison—and they were all sober. You know, the, all these, all the Andy Warhol people were sober, huh. all these cool people. And so I wanted to be a part of that now. And they were still having fun and they were still full of shit and they were still <laughs> full of life. Yeah. And that's what I needed. I didn't need to like think my life is over if I can't take drugs. I needed to be inspired. And I think, I think everybody who's trying to get over to the other side of drugs needs to be inspired and encouraged and supported. And that's, I just carry on the link in the chain that people did for me. So what, what was it that finally, um, after 24 stints in rehab and, and probably, you know, I'm sure there's much more to the story than that, but what was it that finally did it for you where you were just like, fuck, like I, I'm doing this shit. I'm not looking back and I'm, I'm all in like, you know, well, it's two crazy things happened. So I had, I had, the word relapse is overused, right? The word relapse means that you were well and then you got sick again. Yeah. I was never well for hmm. nine years, <laughs> though I might have been abstinent from heroin for three months or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
so so the but what happened was I, I had this huge court case, and the judge told me, Mr. Forrest, you're going to the state penitentiary. Hmm. And, and I was just like, that can't, this can't be happening. I just played ping pop last month. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and he, it turned out he was a sober guy, and he took an interest in me to hold me accountable to get well, which hmm. was just amazing it was before they had drug court but he was like if there was a drug court it was where i was with this sober judge and he yeah. just kept brow beating me and you know i call dealing with drug addicts who are using and contemplating getting sober is like herding kittens you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> all, yeah, yeah like in one spot and then you move your hand and they all go in different directions and he just kept putting me back on spot back into custody back to fulfill my obligations to court, back and back. This case went on for, th I think, three and a half years. Wow. And I violated. And, and, and so finally he said, if you don't complete this drug program, you're going to the state penitentiary. And I knew that he wasn't kidding. And for some reason, I still used one more time after that. And I was so scared. And, I, and everything had been so confusing up until then. And in that morning that moment of clarity that everyone talks about, it all just made sense to me. And the sentence that came out of my mouth with no one around was, it's the drugs. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that it's not your, it's not your poo butt problems. It's not your yeah. court case. It's the drugs. And I just really made a declaration that I'm going to do whatever's necessary to not do drugs. And, and I've been sober ever since. That was wow. March 15th of 1996. And so, you know, and, and it's not easy, but it's not hard once you have that, that decision that you make. Yeah. And, and I think that we make the decision. I don't think the decision is based on a bottom. I think that, that somehow, you know, everybody has their own way of coming to a conclusion that drugs just don't work for me. They just don't work. Yeah. How much longer am I going to go in and out of rehab or in and out of court or in and out of relationships or in and out of jobs or in and out of detoxes? How much longer? And you can make up your mind. The book says, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. I'm not a big God guy. So yeah. my thing was made a decision to, to turn my life and my will over to whatever I had to do to not do drugs. And if that meant hanging out with people I didn't like, that's what it meant. Yeah. And if the, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no. something about that decision. People, I don't like the word powerless. I don't like it. I don't, I, you know, the, it's a, it's a very dangerous word hmm. because addicts can run with that. Well, I'm powerless. You can't say that you're powerless and then, but you have the power to make a decision. Yeah. It's just contradictory in my opinion. Do you think it's kind of just depends on what the context you put it in? I mean, yeah, I mean, but we're addicts. We're, we have this primal brain that just wants to get high. Yeah. <laughs> it's, hard to do, it's hard to nuance stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in other words, yeah, if I'm saying, oh, I'm powerless over doing dope, well, then you're fucked because you're just going to continue <laughs> yeah, to do dope. you're never going to stop. Yeah, but, and, and, I, and I only ask this because this is something my, my sponsor and I uh, you know, talk about often is being powerless over just the – just the normal day to day shit that I can't control, you know, because that that's what can get me um, all wound up, you know, all 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 tight in my own ass and in my head, like, um, you know, because I'm I'm trying to control those things that I can't control. If I look at it like, hey, I'm powerless over that. There's not really much I can do about it except shape my own opinion, my own choice, and I'll kind of leave it at that. So I guess that's what I was getting at with the with the context thing, because I see your point. Yeah, if you say you're powerless over doing dope, you're never gonna quit. Yeah. And that, well, and here's an interesting thing. So, so there is something that is the reason why we're both alive. And that is if you put your hand between your, on your breastplate and you relax and, and get quiet, you can feel your heartbeat into your hand. Hmm. And so I had this meditation teacher that always used to say while we were meditating to do that, hold and start to feel your heartbeat in your hand. And he would say, what makes it beat you? not you. Hmm. So the very reason why we exist, we don't have any control over. 
<laughs> that's good. And so then yeah. I started thinking, that's some ultimate powerlessness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he used to do this funny thing. He would say, one day it will stop beating. Hmm. Right? And, yeah. and it just puts the whole thing into context. Like, I'm just lucky to be alive. I'm just lucky this muscle in my chest keeps beating. Well, that's I'll gratitude. I'll, I'll tell you what, and I mean this with the utmost respect, but you are damn lucky to be alive, actually. <laughs> I, after the the uh, the stunt at the Pink Pop Festival, can you share that story a little bit? Um, it, it, yeah, I'll, well, I, I'll put the video well, in the show notes for those out there listening, too, if you want to check it out or whatever. It's a pretty fun. It's in a movie called Bob and the Monster, too, if people want to get that. It's a documentary about me. But, but so... You know, I was a heroin addict and an alcoholic, so those are two drugs you don't want to combine too much. Then I combined them every day for yeah. 20, 15 years. And what happened was I had this this thing where I would I would do heroin when I got heroin when I got up in the morning, and then just start drinking. Hmm. And usually I would pass out like at six or seven o'clock because usually concerts are you play like at ten o'clock at night. Yeah. Well, this was a daytime concert, and we were playing like at six. So I didn't know that until we got in the van to go there. <laughs> oh, shit. So I was like in a blackout from Jägermeister and drinking and high on heroin. And we get there and we do this walkthrough where they're telling me that, that um, you know, the, that Eddie Vedder had the year before climbed onto the television cameras because it was on MTV Europe and jumped off into the audience. And so I was <laughs> drunk and I saw that he's an old friend of mine. I just saw that as a challenge, like, well, I'm going to outdo that. <laughs> and so, so I looked up and I saw this ladder that went up to the top of the scaffolding on top of the concert, you know, on top of the stage. And I thought, well, during the concert, I'll climb up there and jump, jump down to the stage, I guess is what I thought. Cause I knew it's like, a hundred feet up. Yeah, that's way up but, there. But then, yeah, and then the stage is like twenty feet up from the audience. It's hundred and twenty feet. Do you gotta jump to? Uh, so I got up there, and it was a lot higher than it looks from the ground, and I got scared. <laughs> <laughs> Man. And so then I had to climb back down, but I was too scared to climb back down. So I just stayed up there and sang the rest of the concert. Oh man, yeah. Well, even even during the set itself. Um, you know, what were you, there was a point I saw where you were you were like trying to wrap the your guitar yeah, player in duct, duct tape, tape or around something. Our guitar yeah, player. yeah, yeah. He didn't look too happy about that. No, either. he was not happy because <laughs> when I would get really drunk, you ever heard of a band called The Replacement? Yes, they were my favorite band, right? And so when I'd get really drunk, I would want to just play cover songs, like because I grew up watching The Replacements. <laughs> So in that concert, when we have like a hit song in Europe and whatever, and everybody's thinking we're going to play our songs, we played like The Clash and Blondie. (laughs) 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 I remember, and I wanted to keep playing cover songs, and they were trying to get to go back on track to the set list, and I was pissed, and so I was going to wrap dicks up in a duct tape (laughs) until until we could start playing. I don't know what song I wanted to play, like, you know, the boys are back in town by thin Lizzie. I yeah. Think. <laughs> well, um, let's, uh, one, one of the things we we're going to chat about too, and I know this is super important for those out there listening who might be struggling themselves or have a family member who's struggling. Yeah. The family members need to know this stuff. Yeah. Right? And you know, the, the, the six, uh, um, the, uh, 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 totally, uh six questions you, you, you want to ask before checking into treatment. So let's, um, let's start a little bit. Tell us a little bit about the, um, the aloe house first, and then let's get into the six things that are super important to ask before you're kind of seeking treatment. Yeah. So aloe house, um, it was two friends of mine had a sober living, right? And I used to put, I used to mostly only do court cases cause I found the recovery industry so repulsive. So, so I, you know, put my clients in their sober living and then take them to court and take them to meetings and stuff like that. And I really, I've never been a huge fan of the recovery industry. And now I'm a whistleblower against yeah. it. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm doing this and I meet these guys, Evan and Jared, and they're the sweetest, well-natured, they're Canadian guys. And they're like, why, why do you not have a rehab? And I said, cause I don't want to join the cesspool. <laughs> and they're like. <laughs> they were like, but you're the, you're the, you know, so much. And they yeah. said, well, what if we turn this sober living into a, a rehab? Would you, w- would you want to do that? 
And I liked them a lot. And I said, yeah, but if we only keep it small and just like six yeah. people, to, you know, one house, let's do it. So we did it. And of course, you know, we did a real treatment center in Malibu, which doesn't exist. You know what I mean? It's all ass kissing and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yoga and bullshit. So we did a real treatment center. And, and you know, what happened, we had good success and we had good alumni and people loved it. And it became this kind of center of, we had a Friday night AA meeting and speaker and it just took off and it became like, this huge thing where we had waiting lists and we didn't know what to do. And those guys wanted to grow bigger. And I didn't know really what to do. Cause I knew that you can only, I can only really treat like six people at a time. Yeah. Right. And, and do excellently. And, and I thought that we were having the success because I've been doing it for 20 years and I hired a couple of friends of mine and Evan and Jared's heart were in the right places. And, and but it really wasn't working because so many people wanted to come there and we didn't have any beds and they wanted to expand and I didn't. Yeah. So the spirit that I kept, they went on and expanded and how now have true, like, true it, punk it, rock, a true punk yeah. rock right there. Bob. And I just <laughs> I just got out. But I've always been, you know, I love these guys and I yeah. help them with marketing and, and and consult with them and and stuff like that. So it's a trustworthy rehab center. And. You know, I've been doing it a long time. I think most of treatment is about preparing you for when you leave, not about what happens when you're there. You yeah. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. There's too much emphasis on, like, great, gaining great insight from some therapy session. You're going to forget that as soon as you fucking leave. Well, we just I just did a podcast before before this one right now, and we were just talking about that. I, I, I was mentioning how when I got – when I was in treatment, treatment was really the kind of the easy part because I couldn't I – had, I had resources there. I had people to lean on. I had that community there. It was when I got out that was really the tough part. Now I got to figure out how to be a dad, how to be a husband, how to be a new Shane, how how the fuck am I going to be me? I've I've lived this certain way for this amount of years, and then in thirty days, all of a sudden, I'm supposed to be like this new and improved person. Like, nah, it was the work that that went into it after, and me making that choice, saying like, I'm not going back to that shit no matter what, and I'm going to do what I have to do to continue on. You know what I'm saying? That's so my, that, those are my words. No matter what, no matter whether she loves me or she hates me, no matter yeah. whether I get what I want or don't get what I want, I am not using drugs yeah. and that that's an old na term from the 80s in la and it's just gone away the no matter what hmm. no matter fucking what no matter whether i get my way or don't get my way and so so i try to emphasize that in the aloe treatment so aloe is this like cool place where the staff are really cool to the clients we don't but there's no bullshit if you don't want to be here you don't have to be here there's a yeah. there's a rehab down the road we'll get you an uber car <laughs> 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 you know what i mean yeah. and so it's worked really good but you know i'm i always get nervous about where what you know exactly what you said everybody does good in treatment i'll give you a statistic i've been around since asam in the 90s right mm -hmm. asam is the american society of addiction medicine it kind of no longer exists but but they had this weird thing, this study that they did that 97 percent or no, 93 percent of people in the inpatient setting stay sober. And then 76 percent in a resident in, in a residential setting stay sober. And then 50 percent of people in an outpatient setting stay sober. Right. So uh -huh. so everyone's just you know, fascinated by these numbers. And I was immediately drawn to, into the seven drug addicts that bring heroin into a rehab. Those are my people. <laughs> <laughs> right. <on. laughs> you know oh, what I man. Mean? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, so, and what, what, it, what the, the idea was, it showed you that everybody stays sober in rehab. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure that out. But even when you're just in a sober living, going to outpatient five days a week for three hours a day, that number's 50-50. Yeah. 50% 50 of the people go out and use. Yeah. When that goes to the street, it drops to like 10%. So really what our job is as a rehab center, as treatment professionals, is to prepare people for when they could become part of the 90%. They yeah. go and use again as soon as they're out of a safe, contained, protected, supportive environment. 
That's rehab's job, and they do a shitty job at it. Well, let, and let, let's let's get into that because we're going to talk about you know a few of these questions before you check into treatment. But if you don't mind, like what what is your take on why the industry is so so jacked up? Because all the money that came flooding in in 2013, 2014 with the Mm -hmm. Parity Act and Obamacare being upheld at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So the insurance industry had to start paying. So one of the one of the things I pointed out to a lot of parents, a lot of the things that I put in this article are things I just tell parents are just tips of the trade. Right. Yeah. So it's easy to go on a rehab website and see when they found it because they all put it on there. And uh-huh. if they found it after 2013, it doesn't mean they're a, they're not a legitimate rehab, but it but that's just it's too confusing to try to figure out where they're, whether they're one of the good ones that came in during the gold rush. I see. So they should just be disqualified. You know what I mean? Yeah. Meaning you're trying to find help for your daughter or son or spouse or friend, right? Yeah. You got no time to fucking try to figure out who's a sleazeball and who's not. <laughs> but I can yeah. but I guarantee you anybody the the, the the all the rehabs that started up in Florida and Southern California after the money started flor- flooding in from the insurance industry, they're scumbags. It, yeah. They they weren't doing this ten years ago, fifteen years ago. So look for places that have had a long term history of treating addicts. Yeah. You know, founded in 1999, founded in 1978, because because those places have a have a, a like a fundamental understanding of addiction. The ones that came in after the gold rush are just chasing money and they give addicts whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the the how long it's been around. Then another thing is how many if you're if you're ask if you're calling a rehab ask whoever you're talking to uh, well first off you should ask if it's a real brick and mortar real rehab or is this some fucking call center i see you know what i mean because they're all it's all so hard to navigate it's all so corrupt i can't you know i was we talked about i was in the music business for 20 years and everybody says that's a sleazy business that's that's the most honest business I've ever been in compared to the recovery industry. Really? Damn, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. You know, there there's just such sleaziness you can't yeah. imagine. So you should be very cautious. And here it is, you got this you're worrying your kid's gonna die of heroin, then you've gotta navigate through this cesspool of the recovery industry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So so one of the things I, I found as as how you can make a lot of money is to not have a lot of full time employees. Right. I've, I've had like four rehabs in my life. I know these things backwards and forwards. Yeah. So if you ask the rehab, how many licensed full time employees do you have? And if they stumble and they don't know or they don't even know what that means. And I'll tell you what it means. It's easy for me to contract out for 300 bucks for somebody to run a group that I can bill twenty five you know, $2,500 for, I make $2,200. Damn. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. So, but to have a full-time employee that's really engaged with the clients who runs that group, that cost me like a thousand dollars. Got it. Got so it. the sleazy ones don't have a lot of licensed full-time employees. What they have is people that are on their website that run a group a week and they pay, they pay a, you know, a, a, a contracted rate of 300 bucks a session or something. I see. Wow. So how many full-time license and uh, licensed full-time employees do you have? And then, you know, all the websites say the same things, right? You can basically do this screening by just looking at the website. If somebody, if somebody claims they are, they are experts at everything, I guarantee you they are no good at anything. <laughs> 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 like I, yeah. I don't claim to be some sex addiction, you know, master therapist, or I don't claim to know how to treat gambling addicts. Yeah. Those are not my areas of expertise. And you know why? Because I'm not interested in that shit. I'm interested in junkies and how they don't die and how they get onto the other side of life so they can be dads, so they can be moms, so they can thrive, so they can be productive members of society. Yeah. I'm not interested in all this money grubbing sex addiction. That's the new thing, sex addiction, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah I've so, seen that so all over. If a, so if a place says they specialize in sex addiction and young people and old professionals and gambling addiction and bipolar disorder, they're full of fucking shit. 
they don't specialize in in anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you got sex addiction, you go to the Meadows, right? That's where Harvey Weinstein yeah. and Kevin Spacey are. That's the best sex addiction clinic in the United States. Go there. Yeah. But don't claim that some mom and pop rehab in Orange County knows how to treat sex addiction. <laughs> You know what I mean? Or eating disorders. Yeah. Well, you know you're, I mean? you're kind of saying all lumped into one, though. Oh, yeah, we, we cover alcohol. We cover heroin. We cover sex. <laughs> we, we cover eating. We cover, you know, whatever it is. That's that's probably a red flag that like, hey. Well, I've, I've worked. I've gotten my, you know, I'm more punk rock, but I've gotten my spirit, experience and know-how from Dr. Drew, right? And Dr. Yeah. Drew always says, surgeons don't say, I'm a sports sports knee surgeon. I'm a brain surgeon. I'm a throat surgeon. I'm a <laughs> This surgeon i'm a that surgeon you're yeah. a specialized surgeon yeah you know so you chose to be in sports medicine or you chose to be in orthopedics or you chose to be in back surgery you didn't you don't you're not an expert at all of them <laughs> yeah and so all the one. rehabs all the sleazy rehabs are experts at everything if you look at their websites yeah so you know uh, and the last thing i'll say is nonprofits. just think about that word it means they're not in it for the profit. Yeah. So Hazelden, Betty Ford, Cry Help, Impact, all these nonprofits, by virtue of their license and their their corporate identity, they are not interested in being highly profitable. Yeah. So that's a really safe bet. The other thing is, uh, really, should a here's a good question for America: should should a 22 year old kid whose mom works in the school district in Ohio. So she has really good union insurance. Uh -huh. Should that 22 year old kid who's never had a job, doesn't has very little life experience, still lives at home, doesn't even have a car. Should that kid be flown out to Florida or to fucking Malibu to go to treatment that's geared for highly fu high functioning addicts who uh, executives and all that kind of stuff, or should that person go to a program that's designed for them, which is a behavior modification program? Learn how to grow up, learn how to yeah. cope, learn how to fucking make a job resume. Yeah, I guarantee you, these fancy rehabs aren't helping kids make job resumes. <laughs> yeah, well, and they and they they see it. They see the dollar signs in it, right? And that's what comes first. And that's kind of what you're getting at is um, the you know the the person has to fit. It's got to be a, a right fit for that situation. And I think that yeah, I mean, that, what what is that kid at 22 going to go learn with a bunch of um, you know executives or, or or people who are at a different stage in life than 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 he might be, you know? But he's he's not going to learn anything. Yeah, uh, except for envy and jealousy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I always say, you know, I like community-based programs. So I don't know why all these people from Ohio and Pennsylvania are coming to California. Yeah. So you come out, even in the best of circumstances, you come out from North Carolina, say, and you come out for treatment for 60 days. You have no foundation in your home city. Yeah. Right? And now you think you've accomplished something because you're 60 days sober and you've been through a program. Yeah. So the likelihood that that person is willing to go into sober living and go into outpatient back home is, is zero. Yeah. Right. Because they feel like they've completed something, and and so we got a mess on our hands this recovery industry, yeah. and uh, hopefully it's going to get sorted out. But I'm also, you know, frustrated by the the twelve step world in Southern California. I don't know about you're in Vacaville. I, I'm up in Northern California. We're right yeah. we're in the East Bay area. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's much better up there because there's not so many rehabs. But the 12 step community down here is getting a little polluted with rehab speak and therapeutic talk and like hmm. everybody's a fucking counselor. Like, dude, <laughs> tell me I'm full of shit and I need to go to meetings. That's all. That's your job. <laughs> See, your I love job it. Isn't to, isn't to psychoanalyze my internal childhood trauma. No, I, I love that. I just, I just, I like just after chatting with you, cause you know, we, we've never, we never met or, or spoke before, but I get the sense, man. That, and I love it because it is, you're kind of bringing back that simplicity and that, that solid, 
um, just a found, foundation of being simple. Like let's stop complicating the shit out of all of this stuff and let's just get right to the point instead of saying, uh, and, and I'm a life coach. I'm a, I'm, I'm this special yeah, counselor. Yeah, like life that. Coach. Yeah. I, what the fuck is a life coach? Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I really, I don't know because I'm still trying to fucking figure out life myself. So I don't know. What the, I'm know. not going to coach anybody. I've been divorced three times. What the fuck are you talking about? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not anybody's coach. I just know how to stay sober and I want to carry the message to another alcoholic. Who's Keeping still it suffering. simple. That's Keeping it, it simple. Yeah. Right? See what, a, how, how, how big do you think of, of a role um, media and, um, and, 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 and movies and even music today. I mean, how big, that's such a cultural effect. If, if somebody out there who's not really awake, their, their perception versus reality is a bit skewed. Um, it's easy for, for, for people to kind of take that thing on and, and think that that's just no, normalcy, right? I guess it's a normalcy bias in a sense, but how big do you think that role in, in culture is playing on this, um, you know, this, this population of people who are just addicted, well, there's two things going on, the, the, and then they're both really interesting uh, kind of things to me. One is the medical profession has made heroin addicts out of millions of Americans. Yeah. And how they're going to explain themselves, I don't fucking know. The only three things I can think of a doctor who's been prescribing tens of thousands of doses of Oxycontin, which is basically heroin anyways, yeah. how they can explain themselves is they're either, I'm, I'm greedy I wanted to make a bunch of money. They're not going to say that. Um, or what I did was right, which I think was approaching 700,000 opiate overdose deaths since OxyContin was put on the market. I don't think you can really defend that it's not harmful. Yeah, no. That what they're doing, what they did was right. So the only other thing they can, they, they can defend themselves with is I'm stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so doctors, they can play doctors the dumb are either, Doctors are either greedy or fucking did the right thing or they're stupid. Yeah. That's the only the conclusion. Well, and it's, it's going to it's gonna be. 700,000 people have died. It's, Think it, it, about that. That's that's a it's an astronomical rate of of and, and I put legal in quotes this legalized drug and if you go back uh, I, I had watched this yesterday actually 1998 interview where uh, Purdue Pharma came out and said that they they literally said oxycotton safe it's a safer alternative it's not to addictive what, yeah. it's not addictive yeah addictive. and so how do, how do you how do you counter that today after 700 thousand deaths I mean <laughs> right. uh, I don't know <laughs> well I think they're going to be in court for a long long time I yeah. Hope. Yeah. So, but the other thing is pot, right? So pot is the most celebrated drug in hip hop. Let's face it. Yeah. Um, everybody kind of, uh, I myself love Willie Nelson and Sue. Oh Dye. man. That's I what, just love yeah. those two guys. But what young people <laughs> who are getting caught up in the pot thing and the romanization of pot and pot is the greatest thing ever. And pots and from the earth and all the shit I hear from kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're not Willie Nelson. You're not Snoop Dogg. Yeah. You're a little dude that doesn't even have a job, that lives at his mom's house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're still playing, you know, you're still playing Minecraft, dude. You're 25 years old. <laughs> yeah. Living in the basement, man. Smoking the bong. Uh. So, so they use these icons and these media things of all the potheads. You know what? I, I read something the other day that Woody Harrelson stopped smoking weed. Did you really? Hear that? I did not. That's, I that's mean, that, that guy smoked pot and been a huge advocate for it for years. Yeah. I, I just wonder. And, and um, so, so, you know, there's all this kind of trying to transfer onto a, a lifestyle when people just need to look at their own lives and say, is pot really helping my life? Is it helping me achieve my goals here, living at my mom's in the basement, yeah. <laughs> playing Minecraft? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I dare say they're not addicts, but they're just, they're just numbing. They're just stoning their life away. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And, and that drug in particular, I'm not a fan of pot. I, I never liked it. I think it's one of them more boring drugs like you, you just smoke it then you do nothing you just eat you, know you just eat a bunch of junk food yeah. maybe that's about I it i like doing shit i like shooting yeah. speed balls and doing shit <laughs> 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 fucking cleaning my toothbrushes out in the garage <laughs> yeah. building a rocket yeah. ship 
what, yeah. uh, what, what do you think from a medical, and I, and I mean a legitimate medical uh, perspective, somebody who may be struggling with cancer um, oh, yeah, and has, sure. I mean, because I, I, my that, friend's mom, Jared's mom, like, of course, of yeah. course. Pete, see, this is the thing. That's where, where it gets has, abused, though, and that's uh, where it starts getting people say, "Oh, I got a medical issue." Well, you don't really have a fucking medical issue. You just you're, you're kind of using that. I, I, you hear that a lot too, you know? Yeah, no, but cancer patients, glaucoma. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of CBD is is going to be a miracle drug in certain things. Though um, I've had family members try it for Alzheimer's and it doesn't work. So really, uh, in in the case of my family member, but. But, you know, you hear things about about CBD oil and and CBD uh, for dementia. It didn't work with my family member. But but, yeah, there's I'm not saying drugs are bad. I, yeah. I Oxycontin is the greatest drug for when you're dying of cancer. Mm-hmm. And I'll give an example. I, have, I had a friend of mine's dad was dying of cancer. His grandson was graduating from college. He so wanted to go. Getting him doped up on Oxycontin made him have the ability to walk, get out of bed, walk to the car, get in the car, go to the graduation ceremony, go to lunch, hang out, yeah. be with his family for one last time. That's what that drug was marketed for. That's awesome. Yeah. Not for pain management when you got yeah. a fucking hemorrhoid. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I you- seen, how about this? Years ago, before the Oxycontin really hit, I had a client that was prescribed Vicodin for PMS. Really? Like that. Like the doctors in this country got got into this idea that opiates are harmless. Yeah. Opiates are not aspirin, brother. Let me tell you. No. <laughs> can, can you can you imagine that conversation though, Doc? I got a huge fucking hemorrhoid. I really need some oxycotton for this. Like, I'm what sure. does that sound like? <laughs> I'm yeah. Sure that, I'm sure you can find it. And, yeah. uh, a case of that. But, you know, so we got this opiate epidemic and we got this marijuana um, kind of marching to wherever we're going. You know, an interesting thing here in California, I don't know if you noticed. So we politicized the legalization of pot so much we didn't pay attention to the details. Mm -hmm. So, you know, will it pass? Will it won't it pass? The, you know, legalization of pot. So what happened was in the law, they didn't define whether it's an intoxicant or not. So. Mm -hmm. So now the expectation is in January that you can just smoke pot in any smoking section in the, in California. So there's smoking sections at Disneyland. Can yeah. can people just smoke weed right next to four year olds dressed as as Minnie Mouse? Yes. <laughs> yeah, man. Not, see, and that that to me, like if I had my kids there, my kids are seven and three. If I'm at Disneyland, and I don't even cigarette, and I, I I hate to sound sound like a hypocrite because I used to smoke cigarettes, but I cannot stand the smell of cigarettes now. And so same with yeah. same with pot. And if I'm at Disneyland, that's not. You know, that's that's going to piss some people off. That's for sure. I know it pissed me off. I know. But the, the idea is, is this advocacy. See, I just I just want people to rise up to their better, higher selves. I try to do that. It's hard, man. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. And and but, you know, I don't. I, uh, here's the situation. I had I had my son seven. I have a seven year old, too. Mm-hmm. And we were at a basketball game two years ago. And this guy was just cussing like crazy Hmm. like fuck every other word sitting right in front of me and my son (laughs) and i was just like and i you know i made eye contact with him one time when he was turning around to sit down i was like dude i I just did my thumb at my son like dude i got a five-year-old with me yeah yeah. he just completely ignored that like he paid 137 dollars for his ticket (laughs) he can do whatever he wants i wanted to fucking hit him with a baseball bat but (laughs) but i've but I've matured in life. Yeah, I'm mature now. Yeah, Bob is mature. <laughs> you yes. didn't even think like, oh, yeah, sorry, dude, sorry. Yeah. You know, we all need to rise up to that, like, oh, sorry, yeah, your kid's here, sorry. I yeah, a little, a little fucking dignity and respect and uh, understand. <laughs> people don't, well, people don't understand etiquette sometimes either. I mean, maybe he didn't have a kid. Maybe he's just an asshole. Who knows? But there should be a certain etiquette of respect for other people's stuff or place or time or if your kid's around. And um, I don't think there's a basic concept for some uh, human beings out there, unfortunately. I'll give you another example. So I took my same son this year to see Danzig and, Min- and Ministry, right? Oh, that's right. And, and... Everybody was cussing and there was like, you know, a lot of 
nakedness it seemed like going on <laughs> and i i had to you know steer him around because i've taken a 7 year old to a concert that's not probably yeah. Uh, geared for. Yeah. Right. So the responsibility lies on me because I'm not going to tell them not to cuss or not to be wearing their bondage outfits because that's what Danzig and Ministry are for. Yeah. yeah. So everybody needs to rise up to what is appropriate in given circumstance. At a Clippers game, you, when there's a five year old next to you, don't say fuck every other word. Yeah. And at a ministry concert, don't run around expecting people not to be at a ministry concert. You're the parent. You brought your seven-year-old there. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love that you play the the other side of that too, because I think that's a that's a great a great point. Um, it is our responsibility to kind of to rise up and do that. Um, speaking of music, are you still are you working on any projects right now? Are you doing any music? Or have you kind of have you have you have you laid that that part of your life down? What does that look like for you these days? Well, I, I still play music, but it's just for fun and, yeah. and you know, and, uh, you know, this, I made this record called the bicycle thief. That's about getting I sober saw that. and yeah. Yeah. And everybody cool. loves that record so much. It was 20 years ago. And Josh, the guitar player from the chili peppers was, is a, he and I made it. So he's got some time off this year. They're just ending their three year tour. And so he and I have talked about getting together and making another Bicycle Thief record. And that's fun. I just like playing music with my friends. It's not yeah. serious. I don't yeah. expect to make a living out of it. And it's such joy. Just just recording a song that you're proud of and want to play for your friends. It's yeah. back to like how it was in the beginning for me. And I, I'm just blessed. I, I don't know. I didn't deserve this, dude. I steal steal change out of my friend's drawers huh. you know? <laughs> <laughs> well let's uh i i don't want to i want to be respectful of your time we got a, a few minutes left um let's kind of end on a, on a real a, a real high note here no pun intended um what is life like for you today bob like in recovery um you know like how how is it um that 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 you're really practicing your recovery on a daily basis and what can you leave with those out there listening who might be struggling right now who are just looking for a little hope well, people that are struggling, you know, the, the, the stories of you and I and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of addicts that have gotten clean. I mean, I failed a thousand times. I mean, you know, but keep trying. And then one day it just all clicks and it all leads to a whole nother existence. Yeah. And my existence now, um, there's a part of the big book that everybody quotes, but they quote it out of context. It's called acceptance is the key to all my problems today. You know, that, mm -hmm. that yeah. part that everybody yep. quotes. Well, when you really read that, not just the little paragraph that everyone loves, but read that story of Dr. Addict Alcoholic, he's talking about what an asshole he is to his family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, how judgmental yeah. and grumpy and, and how he's able to be so kind and loving and thoughtful towards alcoholics and Alcoholics Anonymous. And then just turn right around that same night and browbeat his wife with, yeah. like, how come she didn't finish the dishes? <laughs> and so the last three years of my life has been trying to practice these principles right in my home and be, huh. be a thoughtful dad and a listening dad and a thoughtful husband, a listening husband. And, and it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to practice because we think we can just treat our most intimate people in life like shit, and we got to go kiss ass to people we don't even know. We yeah. got to, and that's what the whole story's about: getting, turning your glasses around. Yeah. That the people that you're kissing ass to don't matter at all, and your wife and children and friends and family, those are the people that matter. And so, are you treating them with love and tolerance? Are you treating them with kindness and 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 allowance? Yeah, you know, to have shortcomings themselves right that's what i've been doing and it ain't easy <laughs> no yeah I, well, I was just i was just gonna say man thank you for for sharing that because um you know i it, one of the great things about being able to do this show and and have you know the, the the little sober guy platform and get to talk to a bunch of cool people i get to learn stuff um and share it with others but like something like that that you just shared that's huge for me just in my own recovery because uh, th th I've, I've never looked at it from that perspective i guess um that the ones that are closest to us can sometimes be the easiest ones that we kind of, we, 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 I don't want to say pawn off. I don't ever want to think that I would pawn off my family, no, but, but you just it's feel just like you can. Yeah. I, I'll give the best example. So, so, um, so I, I when I'm feeling my moods, yeah. I, I expect my 
my wife and and close friends to tolerate it. Hmm. But I I need to reciprocate that when they're in those moods. And instead, I always want to, you know, point out what they're doing wrong or yeah. or, or you know what I mean. And I yeah. got to think like, man, I get in my moods. You know, there, there's a depression cycle that runs through this whole thing for me hmm. and for my wife. And we just get into it and you got to just love the person and ride it out. And I just nowadays the last year or so, I just remain quiet. I know yeah. she's in that mood. I know it'll pass in a couple of days and I don't try to solve it or yeah. or point out what caused it or what she could do to get out of it. Yeah. I just um, Let me let me let me put my tool belt. Let me put my tool belt on, babe. Let me fix this <laughs> yeah. shit right now. Let and she's like your shit, she, she's like when fuck I'm in you. My mood, don't you talk to it, me. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and 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 most of the time and I I'm I'm still man, I, I suck at this. I'm learning. I, I guess I'm getting a little better, but most of the time she doesn't want me to fix that shit. She just wants me Nobody to listen. Wants that. Yeah, she we just wants me to listen. Listen, that's it. it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, d- exactly. I don't want that crap. So yeah, man, that, that's so that's so important, man. That's huge. Well, um, hey Bob, uh, uh, where where can folks uh, reach out to you? Find you uh, uh, any social media sites, a uh, website? Yeah, um, just mainly that rehab, Bob. I always check that, and there's a lot of new stuff up on there all the time. So just get on rehab, Bob, and you know, just hang out and, and send it to your friends whose kids maybe are on drugs so they can get some information. Cool, Bob. Thanks for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it, man. It's great to Thank have you. Thank you, man. Um, for, for more information, you can go to www.thatsoberguy.com. We'll have all the links uh, to everything uh, Bob and I talked about today. Uh, peace, love, respect. Keep your blood clean.